Schizophrenia is maladaptive. But there's a disease related to schizophrenia which have an adaptive advantage. Like sickle cell anemia. In one context is a hematological disaster, and in other settings can protect you against malaria. And sickle cell anemia has evolved in sub-Saharan Africa, Mediterranean areas. Where's a frequent solution? But. There's not a bad gene. There's only a bad gene and bad environment interaction. Tay-Sachs disease. Is a congenital disorder found in Ashkenazi Jews. Full-blown version produces a cortical failure to develop in children, and die shortly after birth. But. If you have a partial version of Tay-Sachs disease. You're resistant to tuberculosis. That's why they said, Jews don't get tuberculosis. Cystic fibrosis. Full version, is an inflammatory disease, your lungs fill up with fluid, often dead at 20. But. With a partial version, you're protected against cholera. Which keeps you from losing all your fluids due to cholera because of dehydrating. But. Which's the mild genetic version of schizophrenia? 1970s. Seymour Keating. They interviewed every family of every adoptee on Denmark for 12 years, around 10,000 people, to see the development of schizophrenia. On the average, they discovered a mild genetic version of schizophrenia within some family members. Called schizotypal personality. They have somewhat loose associations. Social withdrawal, very solitary. And, metamagical thinking, they believe in strange things, like science fiction and fantasy. 1930s, Paul Radin. In traditional human societies. They called them half crazy. The shamans, the witch doctors, etc. Individuals who make a living being metamagical. So. In traditional societies, shamans are powerful members of society. That's why they've been passing copies of their genes just fine, where these metamagical thinkers have been doing wonderfully throughout human history. In the right settings, it makes you a powerful and very sanctioned member of society. And the numbers suggest the 1 colon 2 percentage rate of schizophrenia had throughout human cultures, and the number average population size of human villages, and the number of shamans, it works about right. Two shamans, one schizophrenic. Gallup poll in USA. 25% believe in ghosts. 36% believe in mental telepathy. 47% believe in UFOs. Plus 50% believe in the devil, and it influences daily activities. The same schizotypal runs throughout all the belief systems of human societies. Who invented this? All these beliefs were not designed by committees, these were designed by extremely formative and influential schizotypal throughout history. Mainly by religious leaders who invented the theology that there's is very often a thread of metamagical thinking that goes through it, and it falls in the spectrum of schizotypal, who get it right. But. Get it wrong. Like David Korsh in Waco. Or James Jim Jones in Jonestown. Or Charles Manson. And they're highly metamagical in their thinking, highly charismatic, but we classify them as cults. Where Manson is a diagnosed schizophrenic, and the other two diagnosed with mild versions of it. All human societies have a strong need for a certain degree of these folks around, but you need to get the ratios right. Structure of religious belief. Only one God. Trinity. It's a social community. Ritualism. Religion is daily bread, religion is not just cake on Sunday. Also. We all fall into obsessive little rituals during times of anxiety. But. There's a psychiatric disorder, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. In the full version, it destroys lives. They spend six hours a day washing their hands, can't hold down jobs, can't hold any relationships, etc. And the washing process is ritualistic, certain soap, certain temperature of the water, certain towel, etc. Also. They have constant sequences of numbers going in their head. Constant jingles. Intrusive thoughts. Symmetrical things. Where OCD is an anxiety disorder. A pathological attempt to impose structure, predictability, and control, in a world full of disease, uncertainty, and anxiety. It's a fixed action pattern, but they can't never escape of it. Religious leaders. Where some of them are the people who are best at doing rituals. E.g. 1. Orthodox Hinduism. Brahmin. Somebody who devotes his entire life to ritualistic practice, in pursuit of their religion. He spends six hours a day in cleansing rituals, in what sequence he washes every hand, how many times, etc. Why people with OCD don't get depressed? Because they're convinced that the next thing they do, it's going to be the final one. What's the advantage of a mild version of OCD? It helps you in an environment that requires discipline, hard work, etc. Coming back. E.g. two of religious leaders. Orthodox Judaism. A lot of laws built around food preparation. Ritualistic cleansing. Special prayers. Magical numbers like. 365, days of the year. 248, bones they believed we had in Middle Ages. 613, the sum of 365 plus 248, which are rules for daily behaviors. 365 prohibitions, and 248 things that have to be done every day. But. The rules aren't written down, and some people claim they know them, just for a living. Which means. That the numbers are more important than the content. E.g. 3. Orthodox Islam. Rules of food. Rules of how you enter and leave a holy place. Washing. Magic numbers, 7, 10, 70, 100. 
e.g. 4. Orthodox Christianity. Counting rosaries. Magic numbers, 3. Prayers. Cleansing. Numerology. Freud said. OCD as an individual religiosity, and religion as a universal obsessional compulsion. St. Ignatius of Loyola said. Scrupulosity as someone who is going thought religious ritual for its own sake. They're just doing the rituals without thinking of the content. Also. Orthodox Judaism said. That when you read the Torah, you are not allowed to do it by heart, you need to read the words. Also. Muhammad, in Islam said. People who give prayers without thinking about the content, the prayers don't count. But. When this people put of these rituals in the religious setting. It's not because the anxiety goes away, it's to share it. Next scale of application of ritualism. Franz Kafka. The hunger artist. About a person who performs starving themselves in a ritualistic way, for people to come and watch. So now you have people who could make a living performing the rituals. E.g. 1. Traditional Hinduism. The Gayatri Mantra. You're supposed to say this mantra 2,400,000 times in a lifetime, to guarantee a good afterlife. Where some people hire other people to come and do the rituals for you. E.g. 2. Orthodox Judaism. Food preparation. You can get a job around ritualistic preparation of food. And even people watching the people who do the food, to make sure they're doing it in the right way. E.g. 3. Western religion. People who hire a clergyman to go on certain special occasion to do something to ritualize a transition. Today you can do these rituals, with complete health insurance and retirement package. A book called Xenocide. By Orson Card. About a multiplanetary empire. People realized a near planet had smart people. Which could produce revolutionaries that would lead the empire. So. They created a virus that caused OCD, that was integrated into the DNA so it could be passed on multi-generationally. Once they deployed the virus, the people on the planet conceived them as religious experiences. And within few generations, they become a priestly class, who spent their time doing obsessive rituals. So, the rest of population couldn't think of revolting against the empire, because they needed to spend all their time feeding the priestly class. And that planet was no worry to the rest of the empire at that point. E.g. 16th century. Luther, an Augustinian monk. He was the only son of a very aggressive and violent father. One day he gets caught in a lightning storm. He had a panic attack, and makes a devotional agreement, that if he can survive this lightning storm, he will become a monk. Then. He survives and becomes a monk. But. He's paralyzed with his ritualistic training. He leaves records about spending six hours per day in confession. Because he thought he did things wrong, that he didn't say the prayers in the right way, etc. And at some point, the priest said to him due to exasperation. God isn't angry with you, for some reason you're very angry with God, God doesn't care how many times you're washing your hands. And Martin wrote. The more I wash, the dirtier I get. And this was Martin Luther. The founder of Protestantism. Somebody who takes his personal affliction, and turns it into Protestantism. And all of these makes us wonder. Who invented knocking on wood for good luck, who was the Jew with an obsession with the number 18, etc. This proves that, if have OCD, religion can provide a sanctuary, and even making a living doing religious rituals, and creating new ones. But why all these religious have the same rules? Cleansing. Food preparation. Entering and leaving religious places. Numerology. Maybe it's a sort of convergence. But also. Some of the people who invented these religions rituals, had a background of OCD. OCD has an incidence from 1 to 10% of the population. So probably these people were at the right time during some type of crisis, so people follow them readily because it brings them hope. So. Everything points that there's a parallelism between. Schizotypal personality plus metamagical thinking of religious theology. And. OCD plus ritualism of orthodox religion. Either way. One of the healthiest things you could do with your life is to be religious. It's a protector against major depression. Extends your life expectancy, you're more likely to have limits, like not drink too much, etc. But. The benefits come from the social community that you get by being religious. Covariance between biology on behavior and patterns of religious belief. Take a hungry pigeon. And instead of him to press a lever ten times to get food, you randomly reward him. But pigeon need to come up with an attribution, what I did to cause this food to appear. So now you have superstitious condition, where the pigeon do ritualistic things over and over, in the belief that that's the cause of the food appearing. And if you do this with a lot of pigeons, each one of them will have his own ritualistic belief. The enforcement of superstitious belief. But why we have a societal need for much of this? Because we're trying to explain the unexplainable. Looking for causal links of things that may or not be associated. How tight of a link do you need between cause and effect to believe that there has been cause and effect? No. Take rats and damage their hippocampus. They get more trouble making causal sequential links and events. Rats with hippocampal damage are more vulnerable to superstitious conditioning. Besides. We all differ in our number of hippocampal neurons, number of enzymes, amount of myelin, etc. Which makes some people more vulnerable to these beliefs. Epilepsy. If you have some kind of epilepsy. Your religious belief system gets compromised. Epileptic seizures are generated in different parts of the brain. 
and this epilepsy originates in the temporal lobe, containing the hippocampus and amygdala. Gershwin published a paper describing temporal lobe personality. A personality trait that become common in people with temporal lobe epilepsy. The person becomes extremely serious and humorless. You get neophobia, you don't like new things. You get hypergraphia, you begin to write obsessively. You become obsessively interested in religious and philosophical subjects. But. You don't get religious, you're only interested in religion and philosophy. Now neurologists are speculating someone who in history had temporal lobe epilepsy. And this was St. Paul. Who had seizures. He wasn't humorous. He had hypergraphia. High interest in religious and philosophical subjects. Novel, Lying Awake, by Mark Salzman. Talking about a nun struggling with life, was not doing great as a nun. And in his last years, she's had religious visions. She became famous, write books, etc. But. It was due to a tumor in her temporal lobe, which is causing temporal lobe seizures. What I'm not saying. One you got to be crazy to be religious. Two most people who are religious, are psychiatrically suspect. Both are nonsense. What I'm saying. One it's fascinating that the exact same traits which in a secular context are life destroying, separate you from the community. And in the right setting are at the core of the protected, sanctioned, rewarded, and valued in religious settings so often. And it's one of the most defining things in the life of some people, deciding how religious or irreligious they're going to be for the rest of their life. But sometimes. It might be due to a neurotransmitter hiccup because of a genetic influence, or a tumor in your temporal lobe, etc. 2. Why some of us lose, or gain faith at some point in our lives. Where it might be because merely of a biological process. Instead of thinking through it.